This morning we spoke of uh, Revelation chapter 10, verse um, 7, concerning the fact that the seventh trump was about to sound, not that it was sounding, and that our Father told us he had foretold us all things from the prophets. So if you need to know something, you go to the prophets. What the prophets didn't tell, the apostles did. So you kind of got it all in hand. Nothing to get all uptight about, nothing to worry about. Our Father's in control, and he uh, leads us and guides us. So tonight we're going to talk about nations. And that's to say nations as they apply today. We have a lot going on in the world. So that's what we want to talk about. Is what is happening among the nations, what nations you should be watching, and uh, we'll see what we can make from that, okay? Now, open your Bibles, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 38. Who's coming against us? That's what you want to know. In Ezekiel 38, we are told that Rush, Rush, R-O-S-H in the Hebrew tongue, that it will come against us, but we don't have to worry that much because God's going to stop them. So Ezekiel 38, verse 1, with that word of wisdom from our Father, let's go with it. What about this nation? And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. This word, chief prince... In the manuscripts is R-O-S-H. It would later be changed by the Volga to Rush, R-U-S-S, and then later Russia. So we don't have any doubts, this red nation, uh, that um, was prophesied all the way back in the 27th chapter of of Genesis, 27th chapter of Genesis, that they would always be away from the fat of the land. Meaning they weren't going to be blessed that much with good crops like we are in this nation. And other places in the world that are below that uh, uh, parallel. Now, um, so that identifies it. And we know, watch it, all right? And be careful what they say, what they do. And say, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince, again, Rush of Meshech and Tubal. And I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor. That covers tanks, jets, you name it, the whole thing, all right? Even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Now who's with them? Verse five, Persia. Now, what nation is Persia? It's Iran of today. Got a lot of trouble going on there in Iran. Iran's flexing its muscles, and it's gotten away. You know, Iran has declared war on us several times, and we haven't done a thing about it. They killed uh, over 200 Marines in uh, Lebanon in a building. They have... They, they, that order came straight from the mullahs. And many other things they have done down through the years. And they haven't had to account for it. You know. And they get all upset if you say anything about their religion. Like we have some mullahs in up north, Minneapolis, that wanted to pray on an airplane and have seat belts a certain way. And... Just raise sand, going to sue the people. Do you know that I can't even take a King James Bible into Saudi Arabia? Much less pray. What's quite wrong with that picture? You know, it's about time that uh, something is done here, okay? That's not, that's going to fester pretty fast now. Okay, who else is there? Persia, Ethiopia. This is those countries, Somalia, and all leading on up and around into Africa. And Libya, Libya's going to be with them. With them, all of them with shield and helmet. 
And so there you've got some nations that you want to watch. Told to you by the government? No, by your heavenly father. This battle takes place at the end times. It doesn't take place, it didn't take place in World War II. It's the end time battle when God himself will put hooks in their mouth when they come against us. Why? Well, most of them claim there's no God. They're atheists. And the reason God's not going to let us turn them around is he wants them to know there is a God. So he's going to do a nice job of turning them around. So, in fact, as long as we protect our dignity, we know our Father's going to take care of this situation. So, Turn with me then, if we may. Let's go with some more nations here. Let's take Isaiah chapter 13. Nations we should be concerned with. And I'll warn you, I'm going to give you a little test before we get through. So you want to keep on your toes. I might even, if it's possible, lead you down Primrose Lane. Just to see if you'll go, okay? As to what you should be worried about. Verse 9 of chapter 13, great book of Isaiah. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and furious anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Did he say he's going to destroy believers? No, you don't have anything to worry about. But he will be a little rough on those that don't think there's a God. Okay? And that day is coming. It's a lot closer than many might think. But you plan like it's forever, but you be ready tomorrow. Okay? Always be ready. Verse 10. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. And the sun shall be darkened in its going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Do you know why? Because of the brightness of Almighty God. Nobody will be able to take their eyes off the Savior when he returns. I'm talking about Messiah. Just everything else becomes secondary. His brightness, his smile, his control, his love. Dimish it, dim, makes dim everything else. And I will punish the world for their evil. And boy, we've got plenty of it. And the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease. And will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Who is the terrible one? And his haughtiness and pride is what started all this trouble to start with in the first earth age. Satan's pride. His downfall. Verse 12. I will make a man more precious than fine gold. Even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. That's the richest, purest gold there is. Therefore, I will stake, I will shake rather the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place. In the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his furious anger. Do you understand the scope of that? Not just shaking the earth like with an earthquake, but also heaven. In other words, it's over. You better be standing on a rock that cannot be shaken. And that rock is the true Messiah. It is the truth of God's word where you're not a sinner being misled down Primrose Lane by a false teacher, a false leader such as false messiah. And verse 14, and it shall be as a chaste row and as a sheep with no man, which no man, ta- that no man taketh up. They shall every man turn to his own people and flee every one into his own land. That's to say out of Babylon, out of confusion into their own land. A lot of people are going to wake up. This has a spiritual connotation also. And this is what you work for is that when it becomes obvious and when Christ returns and is in control, every one that is found shall be thrust through 
and every one that is joined unto them shall fall by the sword. That's to say those that don't belong there. Okay. Their children also shall be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses shall be spoiled and their wives ravished. Do you know what that has reference to? Right before the end, when the false Messiah appears, you're going to see mass slaughter of souls. Not flesh bodies, of souls. And they're going to dash people into the apostasy of false teaching where they are no longer believers. They sell their soul because of ignorance in worshiping that false shepherd, in worshiping that deceiver claiming with his haughtiness and pride, claiming to be Christ, can't even hold him a candle to see by. But people, because of his miracles, will fall for it. That's why God's elect become more precious than gold, being the eyes of Almighty God and the spirits of God, the Holy Spirit utilizing them to bring the truth, uh, <clears throat> to save those that are lost and to help them. Don't be deceived. It's very important. Behold, I will stir up the meads against them which shall not regard silver, and as for gold, they shall not delight in it. Do you know who the Medes are? The Medes are Persia, okay? The bigger part of Persia, the bigger part of Iran today. They're with them. Boy, that little old name just keeps popping up. And it's not good. But our father makes note, and he knew thousands of years ago, he'll straighten the wicked out. Big time. Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. They don't seem to have much trouble blowing children up in automobiles or in marketplaces. It's true. It's from God's Word. Shouldn't be a surprise to a Christian what to expect. And Babylon, that's to say the state of confusion, Iraq, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It's just all, not quite that bad, but I mean in the marketplaces there are hundreds of innocents are being murdered, slaughtered. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. When the change of dispensations take, time, take place, it's going to be interesting. But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures. And owls shall dwell there, and satyrs. You know, we've got one old boy named Satyr kind of interesting what shall dance there it means demons is what it really means but it's just so strange how one very cruel person's name almost fits and the wild beast of the island shall cry in their desolate houses and dragons in their pleasant places and her time is near to come and her days shall not be prolonged there's going to be the birth of a new age it's coming. God has about had it with the wickedness, and he's going to destroy the evil in this world. Where are you going to be? Are you going to be helping him? Are you useful to him? Are you familiar with his word enough that you can, you know, if a man hires in laying brick and never lays a brick and doesn't know how, after about 20 years, you fire him, Right? Yeah. Worthless. God expects you to get, crack the book, to get into it a little bit, to have a, a working knowledge of what it is he expects you to do, what nations to be concerned with. Chapter 14, verse 1. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob. That's all of the natural seed. 
and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land, and the strangers shall be joined with them, and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. Why? Because of Christ. Okay. Because of Messiah. They will be captured, and we will all be slaves to that wonderful Messiah. Slaves in the sense that we serve him. Maybe you would like the word servants better. But, and the people shall take them and bring them to their place And the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids, and they shall take them captives whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressions. They will teach them the real truth, and all the world that wishes to to, um, join shall. And they will have their own kings and queens, as it is written in Revelation 21, and they will come there to worship. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from the hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve. In this world today, in the bondage that we're in in sin, okay, in, in bad nations, in people absolutely thinking they're serving God and destroying souls, it's real sad. And it's a serious, serious situation. That thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased? Now, who is, spiritually speaking, at the very end, the king of Babylon? Satan, of course. And it is Satan that they will say this to. Why is it? The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked. That's to say the wicked one, Satan. And the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke. He that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindereth. Now you want to pay attention here where trouble's coming from. Okay, This is the answer. This is the nation you should watch. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee. And the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no feller has come up against us. And he's going to lay down. But do you know who's going to lay him down? Michael. When the Messiah returns, he's going in the pit. And he's going with locks, whereby we can work freely. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. In other words, he's going to have company, lots of it. And and through that millennium period, certain ones have already been sentenced to death. Short of the day of judgment. That's to say the Nephilim, the fallen angels, and this one Satan. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? In other words, he's supernatural. And he loses every speck of his power. Eleven, thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of the vials, the worm is spread under thee, that's your sheet. And the worms cover thee, that's your blanket. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the homes and the nations? How was he? Because Christ put him there. Now, Who are you supposed to be afraid of and what nation should you really watch? He's kind of tipped you off here. The true king of Babylon. Now I'm going to tell you something and don't you ever, don't you ever start watching nations to the point that you forget who God has warned you against. That's the locust army. That's where the danger is. Is it not written in Revelations chapter 9 that when the Antichrist appears on this earth, he comes during the time of the locust? And it is likened unto that, May through September, even that segment of it. 
and the locust army is called the locust army. Their children also shall be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses shall be spoiled and their wives ravished. You know what that has reference to? Right before the end, when the false Messiah appears, you're going to see mass slaughter of souls. Not flesh bodies, of souls. And they're going to dash people into the apostasy of false teaching where they are no longer believers. They sell their soul because of ignorance in worshiping that false shepherd, in worshiping that deceiver claiming with his haughtiness and pride, claiming to be Christ. Can't even hold him a candle to see by. But people, because of his miracles, will fall for it. That's why God's elect become more precious than gold being the eyes of Almighty God and the spirits of God, the Holy Spirit utilizing them to bring the truth, uh, <clears throat> to save those that are lost and to help them. Don't be deceived. It's very important. Behold, I will stir up the meads against them which shall not regard silver, and as for gold, they shall not delight in it. Do you know who the meads are? The Medes are Persia, okay? The bigger part of Persia, the bigger part of Iran today. They're with them. Boy, that little old name just keeps popping up. And it's not good. But our father makes note, and he knew thousands of years ago, he'll straighten the wicked out big time. Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces and... They shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. They don't seem to have much trouble blowing children up in automobiles or in marketplaces. It's true. It's from God's Word. Shouldn't be a surprise to a Christian what to expect. And Babylon, that's to say the state of confusion, Iraq... The glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It's just all, not quite that bad, but I mean in the marketplaces there hundreds of innocents are being murdered, slaughtered. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. When the change of dispensations take, time, take place, it's going to be interesting. But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures, and owls shall dwell there, and satyrs. You know, we've got one old boy named Satyr. Kind of interesting one. Shall dance there. It means demons is what it really means. But it's just so strange how one very cruel person's name almost fits. And the wild beast of the island shall cry in their desolate houses and dragons in their pleasant places. And her time is near to come and her days shall not be prolonged. There's going to be the birth of a new age. It's coming. God has about had it with the wickedness, and he's going to destroy the evil in this world. Where are you going to be? Are you going to be helping him? Are you useful to him? Are you familiar with his word enough that you can, you know, if a man hires in laying brick and never lays a brick and doesn't know how, after about 20 years, you fire him, right? Yeah, Worthless. God expects you to crack the book, to get into it a little bit, to have a a working knowledge of what it is he expects you to do, what nations to be concerned with. Chapter 14, verse 1, for the Lord will have mercy on Jacob, that's all of the natural seed, and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land 
and the strangers shall be joined with them, and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. Why? Because of Christ. Okay. Because of Messiah. They will be captured, and we will all be slaves to that wonderful Messiah. Slaves in the sense that we serve him. Maybe you would like the word servants better. But, and the people shall take them and bring them to their place, and the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids, and they shall take them captives whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressions. They will teach them the real truth, and all the world that wishes to, to um, join shall. And they will have their own kings and queens, as it is written in Revelation 21. And they will come there to worship. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from the hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve. In this world today, in the bondage that we're in in sin, okay, in, in bad nations, in people absolutely thinking they're serving God and destroying souls. It's real sad, and it's a serious, serious situation. That thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased? Now, who is, spiritually speaking, at the very end, the king of Babylon? Satan, of course. And it is Satan that they will say this to. Why is it? The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked. That's to say the wicked one, Satan. And the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke. He that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindereth. Now you want to pay attention here where trouble's coming from. Okay. This is the answer. This is the nation you should watch. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee. And the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no feller has come up against us. And he's going to lay down. But do you know who's going to lay him down? Michael. When the Messiah returns, he's going in the pit. And he's going with locks, whereby we can work freely. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. In other words, he's going to have company, lots of it. And, And through that millennium period, certain ones have already been sentenced to death. Short of the day of judgment. That's to say the Nephilim, the fallen angels, and this one Satan. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? In other words, he's supernatural. And he loses every speck of his power. Eleven, thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of the vials, the worm is spread under thee, that's your sheet. And the worms cover thee, that's your blanket. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the homes and the nations? How was he? Because Christ put him there. Now, Who are you supposed to be afraid of and what nation should you really watch? He's kind of tipped you off here. The true king of Babylon. Now I'm going to tell you something and don't you ever, don't you ever start watching nations to the point that you forget who God has warned you against. That's the locust army. That's where the danger is. Is it not written in Revelations chapter 9 that when the Antichrist appears on this earth, he comes during the time of the locust? And it is likened unto that, May through September, even that segment of it. And the locust army is called the locust army. 
Where did he warn you of this in the Old Testament? Where your real danger was. And I want you to sharpen up. I don't want you looking at Persia. Don't want you looking at Iran. Don't want you looking at Iraq thinking that's where our main danger point is. It isn't. It's where Satan operates and that's with the Kenites. Hidden from sight of most people. But the control is always there in that spiritual sense. You were given this warning in the Minor Prophets. Turn with me to the great book of Joel. Joel being translated as Yahweh is God. There's no question about that. He's in control. And this is where God gives you ample warning. He talks about the locust army in chapter 1 of the book of Joel. And what he says is the nor takes away all but leaves and the swarmer takes over then. This is the four stages of the locust. And what the swarmers leave, the devourers take over from. And what the devourers leave, the consumer takes the rest. And then he goes into chapter 1 of this book and says the churches are stripped clean bare as though a bunch of locusts hit it. They can't even make a crop of new wine. What is Holy Communion? The blood of Christ. That is to say, the true Messiah. How many are taking communion to a fake? Of course, they don't know that. But how many would? Stop and think about it. What he's saying is, the locust will strip you clean bare. That's to say, Satan's little secret army, which is none other than the Kenites themselves, as they manipulate and as they grow. You've got to be very careful, my friend. What are you to do about it? Leave them alone. Leave the tares alone. Our Father will take care of business. But you better be knowing where to look. Chapter 2, we're going to just spend a little bit of time here. This is the warning. It's your, it's your most important enemy, the enemy you should be watching, not nations necessarily. And that's not to say any intelligent person observes international policies. But the key is what you want to be interested in as a servant of Christ, of God's eyes that walk the earth to observe Chapter 2, verse 1, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. I'm really thankful that Almighty God gave us a big old 33-foot trumpet that sits in the back of our church that points 22,300 miles out into space. And it sounds the alarm of the end times. And it goes all the way around the world. He's really been good to us. He's really blessed us. Just plain folk. Who cares to think big when you've got God's path to follow in thinking truth? Sound the alarm. Watch the enemy. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds of thick darkness as the morning spread upon the uh, mountains. A great people and a strong. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall there be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. That's danger, friend. That's a great army. But do you know what army that is? It's not, it's not uh, Iran. It's not Iraq. It's the locust army. And they are just that way. They are that well dug in. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth, and the land is as the Garden of Eden before them. And behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. 
That's why you want to be real careful and you want to know what the score is. You want to know what's going down. And you want to know who your enemy is so that you can be on guard. To be forewarned is forearmed. And that's what your Father wishes for you. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses. And as horsemen, so shall they run. They're not really locusts, you see. They're people. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. They've got it together, friend. Before their face the people shall be much pained. All faces shall be shall gather blackness, should be translated paleness, frightened, if you don't know the truth. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march every one on his ways. And they shall not break their ranks. They're disciplined. They're really disciplined troops. You don't see that very much anymore. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. Some of them are supernatural. When they march, why? They're God's children. They're those that are, I'm sorry, they're Satan's children, and God allows that army to come against us. But you still have power over them, and you must always remember that. Why? You're on a rock that cannot be shaken. They shall run to and fro in the city, and they shall run upon the wall, and they shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. This lets you know they're not locust insects, that they're people. And they'll come in a window a lot of times through antennae, right into your boob tube. Isn't that what they call the television? Whatever, okay. All right. The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. In other words, when those locusts come out of the pit, there's so many of them, as it is written, In Revelation chapter 9, the sky is darkened, which is a fake appearance of Messiah. Because it's also dark when the true Messiah comes because of his light, as I forestated. And we see then, let's skip to verse 10. The earth shall quake before them, and heaven shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. Okay, we got that. Let's go 11. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. Now, you underline that in your mind. God's controlling or is allowing that army. Why? He's checking out his people. How many of them are studied? How many of them have covered the letter that he has sent? And how many can be had? How many will sell their soul? All he wants is your love. And not too many people know how to love him because they won't read his letter. A letter of love that he's written to them. His army for his camp is very great for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible and who can abide it? You can But you've got to have the truth. You've got to know who your enemy is. And by enemy of that, I mean you have to know who to watch, who to be careful of. And I think any Christian knows it's the tares. You've got to watch the tares. Christ told us that. You know something? There's nothing new about that. The first, the very first prophecy ever issued in the Word of God Genesis 3, 15, and 16 was that Satan would bruise the heels of Messiah, Christ, but we would bruise his head. That means we're the bruisers, okay? And we're going to do it with God's help, of course. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. When you see this trouble 
You want to know we're at that door. No, you don't have to worry about Iran. Well, be concerned. You don't have to worry about Iraq all that much. Be concerned. Has he called you? Have you heard that call? You know, it comes in many ways. It might just be touching your heart to let you know that you've got to serve him regardless of what. That you have to study his word. That you have to absorb it. And you say, here I am, Lord. Use me. Because he's looking for that election. And he has called them. He called them before the foundations of this earth, quite frankly. The real enemy that you must watch is this one we've just covered. As I said, it's real easy to sidetrack yourself and start worrying about nations. And it is serious. But don't, for heaven's sakes, take your eye off the mark. That's to say Satan's army, for he is the one that is the danger behind it all. And besides that, God intends to use you to go against him. So, it's important as we take inventory, and we see so much trouble in the nations... And we see them, you notice Satan's army didn't thrust each other. They were so disciplined that when they marched, they never touched. It wasn't a mob. It wasn't an undisciplined lot. Like you see a lot of armies that are so gangly and so clumsy and so awkward that you think, man, I could just take one squad of good Marines and wipe that whole bunch out. You know, they're so crude. These were sharp. They were really well trained. And, and what I'm saying is they are disciplined in what they do to the max. So that's your enemy. That's who you're against. But he that is in us is mightier than he that is in them. They're following a dead man. And you're following life eternal, our Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you, Father, for the many warnings. Thank you, Father, for your blessings. Thank you for being with us, Father. And, Father, let each of these be a blessing to all they come in contact with, Father. Let them know that one of your children has been in their midst. Lead, guide, direct, and touch in Jesus' precious name. Amen, amen, amen.